Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture in the topic of mycorrhizae ischemia and today we are speaking about a very interesting topic about localization of mycorrhizae ischemia. I think many of you were waiting for this video of course. In this lecture we are going to understand the value of localization of mycorrhizae ischemia in ECG and we are going to learn the basic concepts of coronary anatomy which are essential to be able to localize the culprit vessel in the ECG. Of course, the first question that we need to ask ourselves, what's the importance of localizing the territory of mycorrhizae ischemia from ACG? Anyway, we are going to have invasive coronary angiography to arrange for coronary revascularization. Of course, it is very important to predict the culprit artery, because it helps to guide the revascularization process in case of presence of more than one target lesion during coronary angiography. So, localization helps you to answer this question, which is the culprit vessel? Is it the LAD, LCX, RCA? So, sometimes you are having a patient, for example, with inferior STEMI or anterior STEMI, and you are having two tight lesions you don't understand which of them is the culprit vessel. So when you understand the basics of localization of ACG, in this case, you can predict which is the culprit artery and which is the culprit lesion. And so you can guide your revascularization process. If you only decide to do the target lesion and then postpone the non-culprit lesion to another session. That's why localization is very important. Moreover, ECG still helps to identify proximal occlusions of the coronary artery, which results in the most extensive MI. So ECG is a very helpful tool in the localization, especially in case of proximal occlusions. Another issue regarding ST segment deviation. Of course, we all know that ST elevation can localize the region of mycorrhizal ischemia because the injury vector in patients with STEMI is oriented towards the injured area. This results that the leads facing the injury vector show ST segment elevation and the leads facing the vector tail or in the opposite side of the current of injury shows reciprocal ST segment depression. And we explained this before in the lecture of ECG and STEMI. So, of course, ST elevation helps to localize the region of mycorrhizae ischemia according to which leads show the ST segment elevation. So, for example, ST elevation in chest leads suggest anterior wall MI, ST elevation in inferior leads suggest inferior wall MI, ST elevation in lateral leads 1 EVL suggests lateral wall MI. So, of course, ST elevation is very helpful. And we asked before another question, which is complementary, of course, to this question. Does ST depression localize mycorrhizal ischemia? And we have answered this before, that ST depression doesn't localize because leads with ST depression cannot reflect the affected mycorrhizal region or wall if they are the only ECG abnormality in the ECG. For example, C depression in inferior leads not necessarily implies that the ischemia is in the inferior wall. So in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, you cannot answer this question simply where is the culprit vessel. In STEMI you can, but in non-ST it is not very easy. And so ST depression and tube of inversion don't localize mycorrhizal ischemia, but with few exceptions. Of course, the first exception is the Valence syndrome, in which there is deep symmetrical T-wave inversion in the precordial leads, and in other cases there is biphasic T-waves according to it is type B or type A, and in the Winter syndrome, in which there are upsloping ST depression in the precordial leads together with hyperacute T-waves, so in these cases it is caused by proximal tight stenosis or subtotal or total occlusion in the LAD resulting in anterior wall ischemia. So Valence syndrome and the Winter syndrome, of course, is a case for ST depression or T wave inversion which can localize the myocardial ischemia. In stress ECG also we need to know that the stress induced ST depression which is a common ECG abnormality in stress ECG don't localize myocardial ischemia. So stress induced ST depression for example in precordial leads or inferior leads doesn't imply that the ischemia is in the anterior wall or the inferior wall respectively. But the ST segment elevation, which is a stress induced and it is a not common finding in stress ACG, can localize mycorrhizal ischemia. So, for example, if the patient has stress induced ST elevations in the precordial lead, this implies anterior wall ischemia, and of course, this patient needs admission and arranging for coronary angiography.
in order to localize myocardial ischemia, we need to understand the basics of coronary anatomy, and that's what we are going to do in the second half of this lecture. Of course, we know that there are something called sinuses valsalva, which are like dilatation at the proximal region of the ascending aorta at the nearly the aortic roots, and the sinus valsalva are the site of origin of the coronaries. Of course, we have three sinus valsalva if we are looking at the top image at the ascending aorta. And each sinus of valsalva, of course, has a corresponding cusp of the aortic valve. So the right coronary cusp arises from the anterior sinus of valsalva, and so its cusp is called right coronary cusp, and the sinus of valsalva is called the right sinus of valsalva based on the right coronary artery originating from it. Then we have the left main coronary artery arising from the left posterior sinus of valsalva, and so the cusp is called left coronary cusp, and the sinus is called left sinus of valsalva. And we have the non-coronary cusp, which is corresponding to the non-coronary sinus of valsalva, as it doesn't give origin to any coronary artery. We know, of course, also that coronaries are epicardial, and so they are running on the epicardial surface of the heart, and then it gives branch to supply the heart from the epicardial towards the endocardial surface, and that's explain that the subendocardial region is the farthest point from the coronary perfusion, and that's why it is the most liable area to the infarction. Regarding the coronary anatomy itself, we have the left main coronary artery, which bifurcates into the left anterior descending and left circumflex artery. The left anterior descending, of course, runs on the anterior interventricular groove, whereas the LTX runs on the left AV groove between the left atrium and left ventricle. The LED gives origin to the diagonal branches which supply the anterolateral wall of the LV and the septal perforators which penetrate the septum, that's why they are called perforators, supplying the anterior two thirds of the septum, including the conductive system inside it. The LCX, which runs the left AP groove, gives origin to the OM branch or the arc obtuse marginals, which supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Then we have the right coronary artery, which runs in the right AV groove between right atrium and right ventricle. It gives origin to the coronal branch at its proximal portion, and sometimes the coronal branch arises by a separate ostium from the ascending aorta, and it gives origin to the RV branch, which supplies the RV free wall. And then the RCA continues and bifurcates into posterior lateral branch, or sometimes in literature it is called marginal branch, and posterior descending artery, or called the PDA, and they are supplying the posterior wall of the left ventricle, and that's why we continue these lines in dashed lines. And then the PDA anastomose on the posterior interventricular groove with the LED, or the continuation of the LED. The LV perfusion receives its blood supply from 50% from the LED, and that's why, of course, it is mainly dependent on LED, and 50% equally supplied by RCA and LCX, and that's why explaining that LED occlusion affects mainly, of course, the left ventricular function, and the RV perfusion is mostly supplied by the RCA. Sometimes the left main trifurcate instead of bifurcation, resulting in LED, LTX and ramus intermedius, which is present in about 15 to 30 percent of patients, either behaving like a large OM or large diagonal branch, and so it supplies nearly the anterolateral wall of the left ventricle as it runs between the LED and LCX with slight variation in the course between patients. In 80% of patients, the LED courses around the apex of LV and terminates along the diaphragmatic surface as we can see here, that it turns around the apex or wraps around the apex and supplies the diaphragmatic or the inferior surface. And in 20% of patients, the LED terminates at or before the apex, whereas the PDA is large enough to supply the apex of the LV and it supplies to supply it. That's why in some patients, LED occlusion may result in ST elevation anterior leads and also in inferior leads if it was wrapping around the apex and supplies the inferior wall and sometimes the territory is limited to the precordial lead because it only supplies the anterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. Regarding the dominant vessel, the RCA is a dominant vessel which means that it gives origin to the PDA in 70% of the patients, so here the PDA is the right side the PDA, and so the RCA supplies the inferior wall and posterior wall of the left ventricle besides the RV, 
and the LTX supplies the lateral wall of the heart, nearly the lateral wall of LV besides the left atrium. And in 10%, the LCX is the dominant vessel giving origin to the PDA as a continuation of the LCX proper. So here the RCA is small ending before the crux as we can see here and we call it non-dominant RCA. And the LCX supplies here the lateral wall, steer wall and inferior wall of the left ventricle. And in the least or the last 20%, it is a co-dominant supply between the RCA and LCX. So we can see here left-sided and right-sided PDA large enough and supplying the posterior wall of the left ventricle. PDA may be rudimentary in some cases with small caliper. And in this case, the inferior wall receives the blood supply directly from RCA, from LCX or from OM branch directly. Regarding the conductive system of the heart, we have the SA node which lies in the sub region of the right atrium near the insertion of the SVC. In 60% of cases, it receives its blood supply from the right coronary and in 40% from the LCX. And the AV node which lies in the lower portion of the right atrial septal wall in the sub region, it receives its blood supply in 80% and in some literature 90% from the RCA and in 20% from the LCX. So both the SA node and AV nodes mainly receive blood supply from right coronary in the majority of patients and the AV node is more dependent on the RCA. And this explains why in many cases of inferior STEMI, we can see variable patterns of sinus node dysfunction or AV blocks or both. Regarding the interventricular septum, which includes of course the his bundle, left bundle, right bundle, here we can see an unfast view of the interventricular septum. We have the LED giving origin to the septal perforators and we have the PDA. The septal perforators of the LED supply the anterior two third of the septum and the PDA which also gives septal branch supplies the posterior third of the interventricular septum. So this explains that the HES bundle, left bundle branch with its two branches or two fascicles and the right bundle branch are mainly dependent on the LED and the septal perforator and that's why when there is LED occlusion proximal to the origin of the first septal perforator the patient may develop acute right bundle or acute left bundle and this also explain why in some cases of anterior STEMI we can see patterns of infrahesian complete AV block as here the AV node receives its blood supply normally from the RCA or the LCX which are patent but the LED is affected resulting in infarction of the septum and the conductive system inside it doesn't receive adequate blood supply resulting in infrahesian complete heart block in a patient with anterior STEMI. Regarding the atria, we have spoken about this in the lecture of atrial infarction. Left atrium depends on its blood supply mainly on the LCX as it lies lateral to the left ventricle and so it depends on the supply of the lateral wall from the LCX besides the LED also. And the right atrium depends mainly on the right coronary artery as it lies through the right side of the right ventricle. Both of them can depend on amputation of blood from their endocardial surface, but of course this would be more beneficial in L left atrium, which is oxygenated blood received from the pulmonary vein, whereas in the right atrium, of course, it is deoxygenated blood, so it is a negligible source of oxygen. And so right atrium is more liable to infarction than the left atrium due to less oxygen it receives than the left atrium. Regarding the blood supply of the papillary muscles of the left ventricle, here we can see a cut section in the ventricles at the same level as the parsternal short axis view at the level of papillary muscles in the echocardiography. And here we can see cut section in the LV as a circular shape and the RV as a crescentic shape. And we have two papillary muscles, A standing for the anterolateral papillary muscle and P for the posteromedial papillary muscle. The anterolateral blood papillary muscle receives its blood supply from a combined source from LED and LCX, whereas the posterior medial papillary muscle from the PDA. And so the posterior medial has a single origin for blood supply. And the papillary muscles give rise to the cordy tendine, which are attached to the tips of the mitral valve leaflets, and their contraction are responsible for adequate coaptation of the valve. So any weakness in the contraction of the papillary muscle due to, for example, MI, can result in ischemic mitral regurgitation. And based on this fact,
we understand that posterior medial papillary muscle is more liable to infarctions than anterolateral papillary muscle, especially in patients with inferior STEMI as the PDA is affected. And so this explains the fact that ischemic mitral regurgitation is more common with inferior STEMI, although it may occur with anterior STEMI as well with other mechanisms. But this mechanism is one of the famous mechanisms that can explain ischemic mitral regurgitation and explains why it is more common to be seen with inferior STEMI. So as a conclusion of the chronic perfusion, we have here each vessel with the region supplied by it and ECG leads facing it. The LAD supplies the anterior wall and anterocetal wall represented by precordial lead from V1 to V6 and also supplies the anterolateral wall of the left ventricle represented by lead 1 and EVL beside V5 V6. Right coronary artery supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle represented by lead 2 3 AVF. Posterior lateral wall of the left ventricle represented by the posterior ECG lead from V7 to V9, and the RV free wall represented by the right ECG lead from V3 to V6, but the most important is V3 and V4. The LCX supplies the anterior lateral wall of the left ventricle represented by lead 1, EVL, and V5, V6. Posterior lateral wall of the left ventricle represented by posterior leads from V7 to V9, and in 10 to 15 percent of patients, when it is dominant LCX, it can supply the inferior wall of the left ventricle represented by lead 2, 3, and AVF. Limitations of localizations is, are present, and sometimes they may limit the accuracy of the localization, like individual variation in coronary anatomy. Presence of pre-existing coronary artery disease plus minus collateral circulation. Patients with previous MI, as in this case, there is a scar areas in the heart and so the localization would not be very accurate. Previous capist surgery with presence of grafts. Pre-existing bundle branch block based rhythm or pre-excitation, which of course limits the accuracy of the localization. COPD patient in which there is increased anteroposterior diameter of the chest and in case of inadequate representation, which is a fact for the posterior wall, lateral wall and apical wall of the left ventricle in the 12 lead ECG. And so remember, localization may not be very precise in patient presenting late after the onset of STEMI. As more than 12 hours after the onset of infarction, the ST deviation changed throughout the window phase. And so the most accurate time for localization is in the first 12 hours or nearly in the window phase for revascularization because in this case, the ST changes are maximal representing the region or the territory affected. We are going to have three separate lectures for these three types of STEMI, anterior STEMI, inferior STEMI, lateral STEMI, in which we are going to learn how to localize the culprit vessel and culprit lesion in each one of them. So at the end of our lecture today, we understood today the value of localization of myocardial ischemia and ECG and the basics of coronary anatomy and the most common patterns. And our take home message today, ECG can help to localize the culprit vessel and the culprit lesion in patients with STEMI and ST depression unfortunately doesn't help to localize the culprit as ST elevation. Thank you very much for your watching.